salutations respected viewers I'm George from Ireland and I'm standing opposite number 16 Queen Anne's Gate London it's one of the grey door and the yellow um, brick above now two famous people live there but I'm only here to speak about um, uh, Admiral uh, John Fisher who was our first sea lord 1904 to 1910 so um, uh, John Fisher, Jackie Fisher as he's better known, he was born in what's now Sri Lanka, of course back then it was called Ceylon and his father was an army officer. Um, so Fisher, he was, um, well I suppose bang on average height for those days, would be considered a bit below average height now. He was very full faced, so often appeared to be corpulent even though he wasn't. Um, anyway, he decided to join um, the Royal Navy and he advanced um, very fast. So the, the, the Royal Navy was more of a career open to talents because the army by this time, by the time he joined, had not quite abolished uh, selling commissions. And uh, so he was from a very solidly upper middle class family, but not so wealthy that they could be buying commissions for him uh, or, or anything like that. And those with the right social connections tend to be promoted, particularly the Guards Regiment. But um, for someone like him who was mathematically minded, who was diligent, very hard working, this suited him. He seemed to be inscrutable a lot of the time, though when he became um, uh, very lively or passionate about a subject he would start gesticulating quite wildly sort of lose control and the king once had to tell him to restrain himself anyway he commanded various ships and he commanded various squadrons um, he suffered from malaria at one stage in the far east which gave him rather joint jaundiced um, uh, skin tone and uh, so on people people speculated he must have asiatic ancestry although in fact that's uh, not the case so um, Anyway, he came back uh, to the United Kingdom, was obviously here in London, and the Admiralty is not very far from here, it's only about a mile that away, but he would often go via St. Westminster Abbey, you can't see it, it's that way, for matins if they were on, or just his own private orison. So he was an intensely spiritual man, listening to up to three sermons a day, uh, and would, would uh, discuss them with great interest. However, he felt he had to be discreet about his uh, faith, because it would rub some, rub some people up the wrong way. Um, he was not keen on sport at all, um, whereas the Royal Navy generally is. I mean, you should, there's an Army Navy rugby match, but also you should keep fit. But he, he kept fit with dancing. So, a man of many contradictions. These evangelical Christians tend not to be quite so keen on Terpsichoreanism as he was. Anyway, so he was ennobled, he became Lord Fisher. Fisher. He was able to choose his own motto. So, he chose, had chosen one in English, often they chose one in Latin or French. But his one was fear God and dread not. Fear, in this case, meaning believe in God. Other people say, other people, well, particularly atheists, said, no, 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 it really is fear in the literal sense. Why dread naught? Um, well, it was a pun because this type of uh, ship was, was invented called a dreadnought, as in it didn't have to be scared of anything. It could outgun anything it couldn't outsail, and outsail anything it couldn't outgun. So the, the, the perfect combination of speed and strength, as in the range of the guns and how big their shells were. Um, so when he started off uh, in the Royal Navy, it was still the age of sail. It was before even the American Civil War, as only then when ironclads came in, up until there, there were wooden hulled ships. And obviously, um, by the time he died in 1920, everything was um, uh, made of steel. Castles of steel, as Churchill called them. Big guns, torpedoes. He was an early advocate of the use of torpedoes, things like that. So he was a man of very go-ahead uh, go ideas, which obviously rub rubbed up the top brass the wrong way. Some of them didn't like this young whippersnapper with all his newfangled notions because a senior service, the Royal Navy, it is all about tradition. But, you know, they've got to move with the times, especially when there's technical innovation. So... Uh, Anyway, the dreadnoughts were being built and it came to the Anglo-German naval race. Germany was fl flexing its muscles. As the Kaiser said, we must have our place in the sun. Remember um, the Congress of Berlin in 1885 when Africa had been carved up without the consent of a single African. But the Germans had acquired various colonies such as Namibia, German Southwest Africa as they called it, German East Africa, Tanganyika, or now it's Tanzania, um, a bit of Cameroon, Dahomey, which is a bit of Togo and Benin, and I can't think where else um, then places which are not in Africa, uh, the northern half of Papua New Guinea, Kaiser Wilhelm II land, some islands in the, in the Pacific Ocean like that, what's now, um, I think, uh, is it American Samoa? Um, or is it Western Samoa? Some of those. Tsinghao, uh, a Chinese port. Um, anyhow, so in order to trade with these places and protect these places, the Germans needed to expand their fleet. The German Navy was very small. Germany didn't have that much of a seafaring tradition. All right, they were sailing around the North Sea and the Baltic and so on, but not that far, not huge numbers. Some of those Hamburg-America line. Um, anyway, so this naval race started. The Liberal government was in office and they had these very ambitious plans 
to provide welfare for people, um, but then this demand for more warships was cutting into that. Dreadnoughts, okay, it was fantastic to have this uh, world-beating class of battleships. On the other hand, it was ruinously expensive, um, and it made all the other uh, battleships obsolete. They were either dreadnoughts or a pre-dreadnought. I think it was David Lloyd George, who was Chancellor Exchequer, was obviously in charge of money, said that uh, a duke is more dreadful than a dreadnought and twice as expensive, as in they had so much money. Let's obviously tax the rich and make them pay. But it came into a whole political row about death duties and the people's budget of 1910 of the House of Lords blocking it. Don't want to get into that. And that's just towards the end of Fisher's time as first sea lord. So he wisely tried to stay out of politics. But some people were saying, we want eight and we can't wait. We want eight dreadnoughts now. And obviously Germany was expanding its navy under Admiral Tierpitz. Um, so that was that. It ramped up tensions between the two. It also had a contracyclical effect when there were some economic downturns, particularly in areas of strong liberal support. Remember, the Liberal Party was one of the two great parties of state in that era, building them in Newcastle, in Edinburgh, in Glasgow, in Liverpool, these major urban centres which were quite important for the Liberal Party, and where the Labour Party was growing in strength and soon breathing down the neck of the Liberal Party. Um, anyway, so um, uh, that was Fisher, but um, by the time it came to the First World War, he was too old for active service. Um, so notice that first uh, Sea Lord is obviously um, the, the naval officer in charge of the Navy, as opposed to first Lord of the Admiralty, who was the politician, the government minister in charge of the Navy. And Churchill held that position for some time, was well, certainly right at the outbreak of the First World War, and indeed at the outbreak of the Second World War. That's why all ships were messaged at uh, the outbreak of the Second World War. Winston is back. Just those three words, they knew who it was. The only British politician to be known by his Christian name, just like Boris Johnson today. Boris is the only UK politician known mononymically. Um, so what else about Fisher? Yeah, he, said he had all sorts of um, crazy ideas saying that they should go for the Copenhagen option against Germany or indeed the Japanese. Is without declaration of war, simply attack and sink all their ships. And um, George V said, well, if, if, if Fisher has, has rabies, I want him to bite another one of my admirals because of his um, very uh, pugnacious spirit. But uh, he was perhaps a bit too uh, belligerent because obviously uh, it's not acceptable to simply attack without declaring war. It's obviously what the Japanese did against the Russians in 1905 and against the Americans in 1941 or indeed what the Third Reich did against the Soviet Union in 1941. Um, this is recalling, um, I think Lord Nelson did it once and it was done again after Nelson's death. The Royal Navy sailing off the coast of Copenhagen, Denmark, and did they even give the Danes an ultimatum? They might have given them an ultimatum, but Denmark being a neutral country and sinking most of the Danish fleet. Bearing in mind, in the early 19th century, Denmark was actually a significant maritime power, not on the scale of France or the United Kingdom, but, but larger than you might think for a fairly small country. Okay, it's not large, it's got lots of islands, but Denmark in those days included Norway and Iceland and Greenland, and they even had some territory in India and a tiny bit on the coast of Africa, and they had the US Virgin Islands, so very much a seafaring people. So um, that was sorted out, just, just uh, this uh, unprovoked attack when they're not expecting it, but obviously this would provoke war. Fisher's argument, well, it wouldn't matter because we would have sunk almost all their warships and they wouldn't be able to get us. We're off this island. So the United Kingdom for centuries had a policy of having um, a large navy. In the late 19th century, there was this um, um, act of parliament about it for double power standard. The Royal Navy had to be bigger than the next two put together, as in it was used the French Navy and let's say the Russian Navy. So in case those two made alliance, as they did, if they ganged up in the United Kingdom, the Royal Navy must still be able to to beat them, greater than their combined strength. Why not three power standard? Well, th there had to be some limit to how much could be spent. Obviously, you have to keep taxation down to electorally acceptable levels. Um, so that was um, uh, Jackie Fisher, who was uh, had various other people under his tutelage, BT, Jellicoe, um, Cunningham, other admirals who rose to great fame in the First World War and uh, subsequently. Uh, so yeah, he died in 20 1920. It may seem to be somewhat uh, incongruous for such an ardent Christian to be somewhat, someone who was advocating uh, these unprovoked attacks on, on fellow Christians. But there we are. There's also um, uh, William Smith who lived in that house, that famous uh, Whig politician of the late 18th and early 20th century. But we shan't bother about him. So we're on Queen Anne Gate. It's so called because it was built in 1704, Queen Anne's reign. It used to be called Park Street. I'm not sure when it was renamed. Queen Anne's Gate. Um, there is a bit of a gate up there into, um, into St. James's Park, but that's that. All right, I'll switch it off now.